Welcome to DLA Piper's At the Intersection of Science and Law podcast. In this episode, DLA Piper partners Christy Kung and Greg Badulovich discuss the rise of telehealth amid the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as advancements in technology aiming to address disparate access to healthcare globally. Hello, everybody. I'm Christy Kung. I'm a healthcare regulatory partner in the Washington, D.C. office of DLA Piper. And I'm joined here by my colleague, Greg, in Sydney, Australia. We are going to talk about digital health and in particular its rise during the COVID pandemic and how the world is dealing both with COVID as well as advancements in technology to address healthcare access. So Greg, thanks so much for joining and I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you very much, Christy. My name is Greg Badulovich and I am a partner at DLA Piper's Sydney office, as Christy has mentioned. My specialty is the regulatory side of healthcare and life sciences, as well as intellectual property. And I have had quite a bit of involvement in the telehealth sector over the last few years. So Christy, to start with, obviously we've seen a significant increase in the use of telehealth globally since the start of the pandemic, but it might be useful at the outset to basically just explain our understanding of what telehealth is. Sure. Actually, great question, Greg, because there are a bunch of different definitions. I mean, how I think of telehealth is the delivery of healthcare services via telecommunications technologies, whether that means live interactive video and audio, or if that is an asynchronous, meaning store and forward technology or recorded videos that are reviewed later or uploaded images that are sent across through technology to a healthcare provider to then review and interpret. I consider all of that within the definition of telehealth. And with respect to telehealth, it could be medicine, it could be nursing, it could be physical therapy, anything related to healthcare services. Greg, do you have a different view? Completely agree with that. I mean, the definition that we use here is fairly broad. It encompasses everything you've just said as well as in a lot of cases, medical consultations and affiliated healthcare consultations by way of radio. A lot of Australians living in remote areas, 500 miles from the nearest town with a hospital, and often radio is used to relay instructions from treating doctors, even in the case of first aid. So it's quite important in this country and it has been around for a long time pre the pandemic, particularly in very remote areas. That's a great point. And it's an interesting thing here in the U.S. too, because pre-COVID pandemic, many state laws that define telemedicine expressly stated that it didn't include telephonic communications or text messages. But during the pandemic, when CMS, our Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, came out with their waivers with respect to telemedicine, they did allow for reimbursement and billing for telephonic visits and also text-based communications, particularly in the mental health space. So we've seen some changes in that in the U.S. as well well in order to increase that access. Absolutely. And the same here, I think it was March, 2020. So at the start of the pandemic that the Australian government made amendments to Medicare, which is our universal healthcare system that allows firstly, medical consultations and secondly, pharmaceuticals to be subsidized for Australian citizens. So that was amended in March, 2020 on a rolling basis to allow reimbursement on medical consultations by way of telehealth. I was going to ask you about what it was prior to COVID, if any coverage was available for telemedicine services prior to the pandemic in Australia. In rural and remote areas, there were programs, absolutely, but for run of the mill telehealth consultations in urban areas where people could see their, as we call them, general practitioner, or you call them family physician. No, that was not subsidized under Medicare. However, the pandemic created a seismic shift in this country as it did in many others and healthcare systems have adapted to meet that challenge. This is one of the ways the government here is addressing the ongoing effects of the pandemic on the provision of healthcare services. It's interesting because the figures bear out that last year, so 2021, approximately 29% of 
of Australians had at least one telehealth consultation. And of those, more than 80% felt that telehealth practitioners listened carefully, showed respect and spent enough time with them and indicated that they would use a telehealth service again. So the uptake is not only significant, it's quite positive. Interesting personal story. So I've been doing telehealth work in the US since probably about 2008, 2009. And I did not have a telehealth visit until COVID. So even though I was practicing in the space that I was doing a lot of the legal work in this area, I never personally chose to use it. One, I don't go to the doctors, much as I probably should. And two, I live in a big city. So it's not like I have an access issue. If I need healthcare, I can just go and get it. But my personal feeling on using telehealth services during COVID was that it was phenomenal. It was very convenient. I still felt a personal connection with my physician. It took a lot less time obviously, then going in, sitting in the waiting room and having everything run 20 minutes behind. And I don't know that I would ever go back to only having in-person visits, even when the pandemic hopefully passes us by. So personally speaking, I think that a lot of people feel the same way I do. And this is something that is not going to go away and will continue even post-pandemic. I definitely agree with you, Christy. I mean, from being a father of two young children who tend to pick up colds all the time. It's definitely been helpful and a time saver to be able to have telehealth consultations with my children with the GP. But there are some fields of medicine where perhaps it is easier than others. One of the challenges with telehealth is the prescription of medicines. Not all doctors are able to electronically prescribe medications. And as a result, there's often the issue of getting access to those prescriptions. So in our case, we've had to, after having a telehealth consultation, physically drive to the doctor's office to collect the prescription, which defeats the purpose of a telehealth consultation in some ways, but this is an area that's improving day by day. Do you have any mail order pharmacies? We do. We have mail order pharmacies. I haven't used one personally, but they exist and where doctors are signed up for electronic prescribing, it's a lot easier. It can be sent to the pharmacy electronically and the medicines can be delivered. And in the same way that we have rapid grocery delivery services, there are a number of services for the delivery of pharmaceuticals. The issue of prescribing via telemedicine is an interesting one here in the U.S. as well. Pre-COVID, we have, and we still do, the Federal Ryan Height Act which essentially prohibits the prescribing of a controlled substance via the internet unless the physician or some physician in the physician's group practice had seen the patient in person prior to the telehealth visit, unless the requirements of a very narrow telemedicine exception were met. That telemedicine exception required that the patient be present in a DEA registered facility or in the presence of another clinician who was also authorized to prescribe. So it kind of defeated the purpose. It was very challenging for telehealth models that did require the prescribing of medications to operate pre-COVID. And the law obviously was put in place with the best of intentions. In fact, it was passed in response to the opioid and narcotic prescribing via internet questionnaires. And it was felt that clinicians could not appropriately assess an individual's medical condition and prescribe via internet means only. So even pre-COVID, the telehealth advocates were pushing for additional allowances for prescribing via telemedicine. There was a special registration process that our Drug Enforcement Administration was working on at the time, and it still has not been released. So we've been waiting on that special registration for years now. But when COVID hit, there is another exception under Ryan Height for public health emergencies. So the U.S. government's declaration of a public health emergency with respect to COVID meant that telehealth physicians could prescribe. So that federal law is currently waived when 
the public health emergency is lifted here, it would go back into effect. So that is a big issue in the U.S. And a lot of telemedicine companies are grappling with how they're going to change their processes or what responses might need to be put in place to switch operations to make sure that they're in compliance with federal law if there is not some sort of relief before that PHE is lifted. If there's no legislation passed or the DEA doesn't come out with our special registration, what could be done to ensure that their platforms do not violate federal law? I'm curious if you've had similar limitations with respect to prescribing in Australia pre-COVID and if those have been similarly waived. That's a good question. To the first point that you raised, there is still a requirement to have an existing clinical relationship with the telehealth provider to meet eligibility requirements for Medicare. So limited exemptions aside, what this means is in the year prior to the telehealth appointment, there must have been at least one face-to-face -face appointment between the treating doctor and the patient. When it comes to prescribing medicines of the type that you just discussed, Christy, so opioids, those types of medications are restricted in Australia. and Typically speaking, they are not prescribed as widely as in the U.S. I should clarify. So the law came into yeah. place because of opioids and narcotics, but the law is right. broader than just opioid narcotics in the U.S. If it's any controlled substance, it would apply to things like ADHD medications, anxiety medications, antidepressants. So it is broader. It's not just relating to those opioid or narcotic drugs. When it comes to prescribing, the law has changed. Australia has six states and two territories, so eight different entities, each of which have their own laws relating to prescribing. Now, each of those states have amended their laws to allow for electronic prescribing. Individual doctors need to sign up to become electronic prescribers and meet the necessary requirements. That process is still ongoing. But once that is complete, doctors will need to use their professional expertise and knowledge of the patient to be able to prescribe the appropriate medicines. Where it's not possible to make a determination via a telehealth consultation as to whether a patient is suited to the particular medicine, then it would need to be an in-person consultation, particularly if it required diagnosis that's not possible via the internet. I'm glad you raised the state and territory piece as well, because in the U.S., obviously, we have 50 states, you know, District yep. of Columbia, and telehealth is very much regulated at the state level. So even though I've been speaking about the Medicare waivers with respect to coverage, our Medicare program only covers our elderly individuals, 65 and older, and certain individuals with chronic conditions like end-stage renal disease or black lung. So there's a lot of individuals that are not covered under that. Our Medicaid programs at the state level will define coverage differently than one another. Commercial payers can cover telehealth differently. The states themselves can define telehealth differently and permit certain things that other states will not, both in terms of prescribing as well as the various telehealth modalities that are used. So here in the U.S., if you're a telemedicine platform and you're looking to go national and enroll this out in all 50 states in D.C., you are going to have to account for all of those differences at the state level, and it's quite the undertaking. And it does sound like, at least in Australia, with the six states and the territories, that they all have their own laws, but perhaps maybe they're coordinating a bit better than we are here. Is that a correct assumption based on what you said? Absolutely. So when it comes to Medicare and coverage for healthcare in Australia, that is definitely at a national level. It's more the technical requirements around, for example, prescribing that's dealt with at a state level. Until recently, electronic prescriptions were still not quite there, but significant progress was made in a short period of time. It's interesting to me that you've talked about the difficulties of rolling out in all 50 states. One of the areas that I've worked in and helped clients in and also have a significant interest in is rolling out telehealth services globally or multinationally. So often we have clients come from the U.S. that have a model that works in the U.S. and they want to roll it out to other countries. And typically it goes U.S., K, 
Canada and often Australia is the third country that many providers pick. And that raises some issues. Typically, it's easier if they hire or engage healthcare professionals in the country that they're moving into to provide the advice. However, we have had questions about being able to provide telehealth advice by doctors located in one country to patients located in the second country. Have you come across that? And what is your view on that from the US perspective? Absolutely. And Greg, I think that we first met actually in trying to set up one of these global telemedicine networks, and this was pre-pandemic. I think yeah. it certainly <laughs> expanded during COVID. But from the U.S. perspective, as I said, telemedicine is regulated at the state level. What that means here is that wherever the patient is located at the time of service, that is the state law that will control. So let's say the patient is in Florida and the physician is in New York. That New York physician needs to be licensed in Florida. And the laws, the regulations that are going to cover that particular service are going to be Florida's laws and regulations. If a company is trying to offer telehealth services to individuals in the U.S. but using healthcare providers in another country, then whatever state that patient is located in at the time of service would require that that physician in that other country be licensed in that state. Now, whether they could actually enforce that requirement and go after somebody who's outside of their jurisdiction, there may be some challenges with that. But the law is that clinician needs to be licensed where the patient is located. The U.S. kind of views services provided in other countries, but using clinicians that are in the United States is relatively hands off because the view is that it's the jurisdiction where the patient is located that controls. So let's say the clinician is located in New York and the patient is located in Australia. New York is probably not going to care much about how that telehealth service is rendered because in our view, that telehealth service will be covered under whatever the requirements are in Australia. So that's at a high level, the general US perspective. Very similar to here. There are within Australia, no interstate restrictions. So a doctor located, for example, in Sydney could provide telehealth services to someone located in Western Australia on the other side of the country. But when it comes to doctors in other countries providing services to Australians, that's an interesting point. The Australian law, basically the way it deals with it is it prohibits the use of restricted titles, for example, doctor for medical doctors who are not registered as such in Australia. The question arises, firstly, if such services were able to be provided and if the regulators did not raise any concerns, how would they be paid for? Would such treatments be covered by Australia's universal healthcare system, Medicare? They wouldn't be because the doctor is not registered for Medicare in Australia, but it also raises issues of insurance. So if there's a misdiagnosis or some issue with the advice provided in that case, if it was provided by an Australian general practitioner, there would be no issue of insurance. If the practitioner was in another country, then obviously a difficulty arises. It's similar in the U.S. with respect to coverage because our Medicare program will not pay for services that are rendered by clinicians that are outside of the United States or its territories. Uh, many Medicaid programs are the same. I think the difference is that with a national health system like Australia has, you're used to having health care covered. And here in the U.S., we are used to a lot of things falling outside of our coverage. And quite honestly, that's the problem with our healthcare system is that it's so expensive. So when I think about telehealth services that are delivered from clinicians outside of the United States, it's pretty much a given that those aren't going to be covered by anybody and we're going to be paying out of pocket for it. But it's possible from a regulatory perspective, so long as that clinician is licensed in that particular jurisdiction. So it's a personal choice as to whether a patient is going to pay out of pocket for that service or not. In Australia, in addition to Medicare, which covers basic health care, we also have private health insurance. Now, some of the private health insurers were slow to provide coverage for telehealth services. However, over the past year or two, they have increased coverage for certain 
types of consultations. These include, for example, occupational therapy, psychology, counseling, speech pathology, physiotherapy, and antenatal and postnatal midwife consults. Now, one thing that I thought we could just touch on, Christy, is the issue of privacy, particularly in the context of going global with telehealth. I know that in the EU with GDPR, the privacy laws have become significantly stricter, particularly with respect to health information. Now, from what I've seen, it seems to me that a lot of other countries are going that way. That is where GDPR was previously the high watermark. It seems to me that it's now almost a default and that many countries are reforming their privacy systems to the same level as GDPR. Or do you agree? Well, I agree with respect to the U.S. So we have the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, and that is essentially like a floor of privacy and security rights in our country. It only applies to limited participants in the healthcare industry, though. It applies to covered entities, which are health insurance companies, healthcare clearinghouses, and healthcare providers who engage in electronic standard transactions, which at a high level, it would just mean billing electronically for some service. Apart from that, HIPAA doesn't apply unless you're a business associate of a covered entity. So a lot of these services that are direct to consumer could potentially fall outside of HIPAA's coverage. And the way that we work in the U.S. is that there is authority at a federal level under Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act that essentially says if the practices are unfair or deceptive, from a privacy or security standpoint, then the FTC could take action. So wherever HIPAA doesn't apply, there is potentially other coverage at a federal level through the FTC. Some action could be taken by both the FTC as well as our Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights for HIPAA violations. And then we also have separate state laws with regard to privacy and security. There's talk about amending HIPAA or coming up with a federal law to apply to privacy and security more generally. To be quite honest, I'm not overly optimistic that that's coming anytime soon, but we have had a lot of changes at the state level in our privacy and security laws. And we had California, for instance, pre-pandemic come out with the CCPA and then amend it through the CPRA. And then other states have followed since then. So we've had laws from Virginia and from Colorado. And I do see a trend in strengthening the privacy and security requirements, but from a U.S. perspective, that is mostly happening at the state level. It's quite interesting. Well, I guess we'll have to wait and see. You know, I would say too, with the cybersecurity issues during COVID, increased hacking and everything else, that yeah. there is a lot of concern with respect to the security of information, especially when conveyed electronically. So I completely agree, Greg, that we're going to continue to see advancements in that area, both within the U.S. as well as in other countries. Oh, absolutely. And I think we'll have to wait and see what comes next in terms of the technology. At the moment, we're in the very early stages of the telehealth revolution, if you want to call it that. And I'm excited to see what the next five, 10 years bring in terms of improved technology for the facilitation of telehealth. I agree. And I think globalism with respect to telemedicine is also very interesting and in how we're going to be able to adapt to cross-border services in the healthcare and life sciences space, particularly through the telecommunications technology. Absolutely. I think that'll be one of the key challenges. What would a podcast be without a plug? So I'm going to plug our Going Global Guide to Telehealth, which listeners can access at www.dlapiperintelligence.com slash telehealth. And that guide, which Christy and I worked on, provides information about the regulation of telehealth in over 45 countries and enables comparisons to be made between countries well, thank you, Greg, and thank you for everyone who's tuned in. And we're all looking forward to see where digital health takes us in the future. Thank you, Christy. Always a pleasure. And thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to DLA Piper's At the Intersection of Science and Law podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the series so you can receive notifications about new episodes. 
All information, content, and materials contained in this podcast are for general informational purposes only. This podcast is intended to be a general overview of the subjects discussed and does not create a lawyer-client relationship. Statements and opinions are those of the individual speakers and participants and do not necessarily reflect the policies or opinions of DLA Piper, LLP US. The information contained in this podcast is not and should not be used as a substitute for legal advice. No listener should act or refrain from acting with respect to any particular legal matter on the basis of this podcast without first seeking legal advice from counsel in the relevant jurisdiction. This podcast may qualify as lawyer advertising, requiring notice in some jurisdictions. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. Daily Piper LLP US accepts no responsibility for any actions taken or not taken as a result of this podcast.